Hi, my name is Steve Joachim. I'm the sales manager at Location Sound Corporation. Uh, we sell and service uh, professional audio gear for the movie and TV industry. Uh, most of our customers are production sound mixers, and we're going to talk a little bit about film sound. Uh, when you're doing film sound, uh, there's really two ways it can be done. One, you're going to use what we call a dual system, which is you're going to record your film or your video on the camera, and you're going to record the audio on a separate recording device. Uh, the other way to do it, of course, is to record the audio directly to the camera, which is very common with documentaries um, or low-budget features and other kinds of projects like that. So we're going to cover kind of both of those. But before we do, we want to talk about the most important piece of gear for for film sound. Of course, that's going to be the microphones. Um, there are several kinds of microphones, and we need to cover exactly what those are. The first and most common kind of microphone is a dynamic microphone. It's often used for vocalists and singers and bands. Uh, a dynamic microphone operates on the principle that the vibrations of the voice turns the sound into an electrical current. Dynamic microphones are very insensitive microphones. They're meant to be held directly up to the mouth, and they're meant to be sung into loudly or spoken into loudly or screamed into in the case of rock and roll. You're very rarely going to use a dynamic microphone in a film situation unless it's a direct interview where you're holding the microphone directly up to the interviewer or the interviewee's mouth. Uh, another example where you would use a dynamic microphone would be in a situation where you're going to record a very loud noise and you need an insensitive mic to do that, something like a gunshot or a car backfiring. In those situations you might use a dynamic microphone. Normally, you're going to have a microphone that will be two to three feet away from your talent and you need a more sensitive microphone. And you'll see that a dynamic microphone won't provide that for you. So let me give you an example of that. On this dynamic microphone I'm going to pick up, if you hold it directly up to your mouth, you get a good signal. If you try to move it away from the, mic from the mouth, this is what you're going to get. As you see and as you can hear, the sound is dissipating greatly. This microphone is not designed to be held this far away from the talent. So you'll very rarely use a dynamic microphone in a, a film sound, unless you're doing an interview or something. A common microphone for production sound mixers will be a interview microphone. This is a Biodynamic M58 omnidirectional interview microphone. So this is very common. Uh, one of the great features of an interview microphone, of course, is that they're generally going to be very insensitive to handling noise, and you're normally going to see a very long handle on it. And the reason for that, of course, is the assumption you're interviewing a subject and trying to reach in with the microphone. That extra couple inches on the long handle will generally give you uh, a little bit of a benefit. So uh, other real popular Interview microphones would be the Electrovoice 635 and uh, the RE50, very popular. Also the Sennheiser MD46, all great interview microphones, something that you should have in your package at all times because you never know when you might need it. Okay, so after dynamic microphones, you have what are called Electret microphones. And Electret micro microphones are microphones that have charged capsules, and they're charged usually by a battery of some sort. Electret microphones are significantly more sensitive than dynamic microphones, and they're often used for news, uh, ENG, uh, uh, lower end uh, productions. Um, they're very good microphones. Here's a great example of a uh, Electret microphone. This is a Sennheiser K6 ME66 Electret microphone, and this microphone, as you notice, has a pretty long, what's called an interference tube. And an interference tube actually takes the sound and moves it down the capsule and allows the microphone to be a little bit farther from the subject than a dynamic microphone, for example. They're not quite as sensitive as true condenser microphones, but they are very sensitive. If you're using an electret microphone in, say, an episodic or a feature setting, uh, you may introduce a little bit more noise into the system than you would with a true condenser. And the reason for that is it's not quite as sensitive as the true condenser. If you use an Electret microphone to get the same range on it that you would on a true condenser microphone, you're going to have to raise the gain up just a little bit farther. And that usually introduces just a little bit more noise in the system. Not really important if you're doing news or uh, 
non-critical recording, but if you're doing a feature or episodics, it's something that you might want to think about. Now, compared to the um, dynamic microphone we tried, this microphone is significantly more sensitive. Now, if you look at this microphone and I put it right up to my mouth, it could actually overdrive the system. You have to be very careful about that sort of thing. This microphone is really designed to be held a foot or two away from the mouth, usually above the head, and you can get pretty good dialogue. Part of it is the sensitivity. Part of it is the extended interference tube that's allowing you to grab the sound directly in front of it. Another advantage of the shotgun microphone, this is a, an example of an Electret shotgun microphone, is that it rejects the noise outside of its direct pattern. It, it's going to take noise that's outside and it's going to reduce that level significantly and focus directly on what the microphone is pointed at. A true gauge of how good a microphone is is how well it rejects sound off axis. So um, when you're trying out microphones and you're listening to microphones, don't just listen to the quality of the sound. Also listen to how much noise it introduces into the system uh, when you raise the gain up nice and hot. And um, also look at the pattern. How wide is the pattern and what are you going to be uh, using the microphone for? Uh, the main patterns you're going to see are going to be omnidirectional. These are going to be microphones that pick up all the way around the microphone regardless. That uh, dynamic microphone that we showed you, uh, that's an omnidirectional microphone. In vocals, generally an omnidirectional is what you're going to see. However, in film sound, you're generally going to see very directional patterns like unidirectional or even um, super cardioids, which is what the uh, shotgun microphones are. Omni is going to be basically like this. If you're looking at the top of the microphone, it's going to look like that on, a, on an omnidirectional. A cardioid is going to be more like this. It's going to be more directional and focused. That's why they call it a shotgun. It aims directly at the subject that you're pointing at. And then you're going to have a cardioid, which is going to be a little wider like this. And you can usually get um, two subjects on a cardioid microphone. Here's a great example of a cardioid microphone. This is a Sennheiser MKH-50 one of the best microphones in the world. Now you notice this doesn't have a real long interference tube on it. It's not meant to grab dialogue at long distances, two or three feet, that you might have on a shotgun microphone. But it has a wider pattern. Rather than being very direct, it's going to be a little wider, just like that. And the, the advantage of that, of course, is if you have two people sitting at a table or two people standing next to each other, rather than trying to move the microphone to catch them both talking. You can actually hang this microphone directly above. The pattern is wide enough it'll pick up both of your talent. So very good microphone to have in your kit is a good cardioid microphone. Microphones are like tools. They're like hammers. They're like drills. They're like wrenches. You need to have the right microphone for the right job. A dynamic microphone, an, a truly good interview microphone, that it's omnidirectional will be right for certain situations. A cardioid microphone is good for other situations and of course you need the shotgun microphone, uh, either the Electret or the True Condenser. So this is the Sennheiser MKH-50 cardioid microphone. It's going to give you a much wider pattern than you're going to get on the shotgun microphone so you can actually mic two people. Okay, now we're listening to the ME66 and uh, I'm going to move the microphone just a little bit from my mouth and you notice that I fall off axis much quicker with the ME66. When I'm talking, I drop off much quicker with the ME66 because it's a very focused pattern. The shotgun microphone is a super cardioid. It's very, very focused as opposed to the MKH-50, which gave me just a little bit more wide pattern to accommodate uh, maybe two people who are speaking at the same time. Many microphones will have what's called a low cut filter built into them. And what that allows you to do is to roll off the lower frequencies if you're having problems. And you'll often have problems with either uh, a breeze or in a building with an air conditioner and you'll want to roll off the lower end so you don't catch that rumbling when you're doing the audio. So um, many microphones will have a low cut roll off on them. Some mixers will bypass this and do the low cut roll off at the actual mixing panel itself or uh, somewhere else in the chain. Um, I find it's best to do it directly at the microphone and take care of it right there. Then the switch just below it is a 10 dB pad and that basically just pads down the audio a little bit in case you have uh, something you're recording that's very high SPL, very loud. We want you to hear the air conditioning that is going off in the background. 
Okay, what you're hearing is the air conditioning in this room and you're hearing the MKH-50 microphone, which is flat, okay? What we're going to do now is we're going to engage the low cut filter on it and listen to how the um, air conditioning is affected by uh, the loss of the low end. Okay, now here's the MKH-50 with the low cut roll off engaged. You should hear an audible difference on the roll off. Now you can roll off the microphone, you usually can roll off also at the mixer, um, but it's one of those things you want to listen to very carefully. Okay, this is the MKH-50 with the low cut roll off disengaged, but with the uh, 10 dB pad engaged. So this should be a little less sensitive. Um, with a little less reach. If you're recording something that's very loud, you might want to engage um, the 10 dB pad. So uh, here's an MKH416, and <clears throat> if you compare this to either the Electret or the Dynamic, you're going to see that this is a much more sensitive microphone. This microphone has greater reach, lower noise, and is a better microphone overall. You can almost pound nails with it, it's that good. So that brings us to another topic, which is really, really important. You know, they say first things first. Well, first things are location. A lot, it's amazing how many directors don't take into account that their location is next to a freeway. They don't take into account that their location is right next to a construction site. And when they get to the site, all of a sudden, it's a mess because you really can't hide that kind of noise. So. Um, Always check that out. Also make sure that when you're doing an indoor shoot, just like this, that you have access to the control of the air conditioning because the air conditioning noise can be an issue. You want to be able to turn off the air conditioning when you're rolling and turn it back on so you don't suffocate your cast and crew. Very important things to think about when you're choosing where you're going to shoot and what your locations are. Not to be too obvious, but this is a mic clip. And a mic clip comes with pretty much any microphone that you purchase. Mic clips are good. They hold microphones. Uh, they're, they're meant to be used with microphone stands. Uh, you really don't want to use this in any other configuration because they also transmit audio directly through them and onto the microphone. And if you have a real sensitive microphone, you'll get bad audio. It sounds bad. That's why you utilize these. And these are called shock mounts. And here's an example of a shock mount with a camera shoe on it so that you can utilize it directly onto your camera. And what happens is you see that these rubber bands here, they isolate the microphone from the actual mount itself because the camera is rolling and any motion from the microphone, the motor, the drive, anything else that's humming or buzzing or clicking or anything, that sound is going through the shock mount, but it's being stopped by the elastics here. Okay, so you never want to use something like this on top of your camera because it's just going to transmit all the noise directly into the microphone. You want to use something like this. Now here's another example of a very nice shock mount. This one's by KTEC. This one's by PSC, by the way. This one's by KTEC. And you notice this one does not have a um, hot shoe mount on the bottom. It's designed to be mounted on the bo bottom of, or excuse me, the top of a boom pole. Okay. And you see this is just a different style of elastics that are going to allow you to isolate the microphone from the mount itself and to keep the noise down. Always utilize this if you can. You're going to utilize the smaller, lighter shock mount with the smaller, lighter rubber bands for smaller and lighter microphones. If the microphone is larger or heavier, you'll need a stiffer elastic or mount material. And that's when you would utilize something like this. This is going to hold a heavier microphone and probably isolate um, significantly better than just the bands itself. Boom poles basically come in two flavors. They come in carbon fiber, which are very, very light, but a bit expensive. And then they come in aluminum, which are generally much heavier, but much less expensive. The general rule of thumb, of course, is if you're schlepping the boom pole, you pop for the carbon fiber. If you got somebody else doing it for you, then you go ahead and you get the aluminum stuff because you don't have to carry it around. This particular pole is a cabled pole. Now, generally a boom pole can come uncabled, and uncabled boom poles are real popular back in the East. Why? I don't know. In the West Coast, we very rarely sell uncabled poles. Um, you have the internally cabled boom pole that can be either straight cabled like this or you can also get it 
in a configuration where it's a coil cable inside the pole. This particular version has a cable exit on the bottom and is a long pole. This pole is probably a 16 foot pole. Um, if you want to put a shock mount on it, you simply take the 3 8 adapter right on the top onto your shock mount. You screw it on just like this and voila. Then you push the release and you can adjust the shock mount any way that you like. Exactly where you want it. You put your microphone into the shock mount and you're good to go. Generally, if you're new in the business and you're on a budget, you're going to buy a aluminum pole. But as soon as you have the money, you're going to graduate up to a carbon fiber pole. They're much nicer, lighter, and uh, perform much better. Right. Bottom line is you're really going to want a carbon fiber pole. Remember, they make boats out of carbon fiber. They make um, a lot of sturdy items with carbon fiber. So uh, if you treat the pole well, it'll, it'll do well for you in any environment. And a carbon fiber pole will be significantly lighter. And that's really everything. If you are standing on a set, and you're schlepping a boom pole all day, a few ounces makes a huge difference. If you do not have a cabled pole, you have your microphone at the top of the pole, the cable coming down, and generally you are gaffer taping the um, cable to the actual pole itself. Uh, it's not very elegant, but some people have always worked that way and prefer that way. Um, but the vast majority of poles that we sell are either uh, cabled or coil cabled poles. And often you'll see a boom pole, this is not an example, that actually has the XLR on the bottom of the pole. So the boom operator will just plug his cable directly in the end here. It's internally cabled through the pole, comes out the top just like this one does, and you plug directly into the microphone at the top. And the key to noise is not to slide your hand. You know, you want to make sure that you're gripping the pole like this and you keep it steady when you move the pole around. And then if you lift your hand, you put it back very quietly. You don't slide around. That's very important. Uh, there's always a great question about how you handle booms and wide shots. And you really have to play that by ear. As I said earlier, you always want to put a boom in if you can. You always want to use the hardwired mic wherever you can. But if the director requires such a wide shot that you can't get the microphone in close enough to get good dialogue, that's when you revert to wireless microphones. At that point, you really have no choice. Sometimes directors will actually be running a widened shot and a tight shot at the same time and you're really in deep trouble. So the only way you can solve that is with wireless microphones. You can run a boom pole either above the head or below the head. What you really need to do is be conscious of the frame lines. You have to be conscious of whether your microphone is in the shot or not. Other than that, you can really place the microphone anywhere you like. Try to get it as close to the mic as to the mouth as possible. That's the most important thing. I think the largest myth in filmmaking regarding to, fa to sound is the myth of, we'll fix it in post. Generally, if you get the sound and the performance that you want on location at the time that you do it, you'll get a superior product. You want to always be careful of racing through the production and not allowing the sound department to get the performance that's being given to you at that particular moment. It's also very expensive to bring talent back in after the fact to do voiceovers. So always take the time to get the best audio possible and save yourself time and money down the line uh, having to redo it in post-production. You can fix it in post, but it's very expensive to do so. Well, ADR is generally um, adding tracks after the production has been shot. Bringing an actor back in and having him redo the lines syncing to film because the production audio was unusable. Generally, the production audio is unusable because of extraneous noise. Once again, the location was next to a freeway, next to a construction zone, next to a parking lot. Um, the director decided not to hold for the airplane that's passing over and nobody could control the air conditioning and there's a continuous low frequency hum going through the audio track. You've lost it, maybe you can't uh, fix it with equalization. You've got to bring the actors back in to record the dialogue and that can be incredibly expensive.
Foley would be the, um, the art of recreating sounds other than the voice. Footsteps, clinking glasses, uh, windows rattling, any noise that you want to add to the soundtrack later that you're not actually going to get at the production location you would do in Foley. Why, why don't you just put one microphone over a rock and roll band and record it? The reason is you want to isolate your dialogue from everything else that you're doing. You want to record the dialogue so there's nothing else there. Then you can add the layers of audio on top of that, the footprints, the music, all the different sounds that make the overall soundtrack are added individually. So you want to isolate those sounds and that's why you can do it in, in um, Foley. Okay, so I'm using the ubiquitous Sennheiser MKH416 microphone. This is a very common microphone for recording production dialogue, probably the most widest used microphone in the world. Coincidentally, this microphone is also the most common microphone used for Foley. So we want to give you an example of a uh,